Thank you, Elizabeth. Happy Father's Day. Yeah. Well, here we are. All parents who've had our kids transition across the threshold are on the other side, and that um, that's a bit of pill. That's tough stuff. Quentin, though, Quentin Stone Jackson, we lost him eight years ago um, on June 10th. He gave us a gift. He gave us a gift of knowledge. You know, and I didn't know this gift of knowledge was was even out there. I didn't speak this language before. But after he transitioned, you know, like I said, the accident was was tough. Thirty hours after he left his body, after he transitioned, I found myself in a room alone. And I found my hand being cut. I didn't know it worked this way. I had no idea. I didn't know what to think. But I knew my hand was being cut. It, it opened me up. It began to open me up. Five days after that, Quentin made contact to us through a medicine man who was, who was in the area where the accident happened. And I'm deliberately not talking about the accident. I can answer questions if you want to know about that. But it was in the Four Corners area. And he, um, he came to a medicine man who had just finished performing a ceremony. And this medicine man walked into the Marriott Courtyard where I had just left, interestingly enough. And there were members of our group there supporting us. And he walked up to a friend of ours named Chris Baldrige and grabbed her hands with the most loving kind energy. She was taken by his energy. And she said, he said, I've just finished performing a ceremony and I was sent to find you. The little boy sent me to let you know that he's all right, that he's fine. And somebody named Tom is helping him with his transition. So Chris hightailed it to the hospital where Christine had just gotten out of ICU from the accident itself. And we were all there. And you know, family can be a wonderful thing. In our case, it, it certainly was. The whole family was around us, and oddly or interestingly enough, there was laughter at times and smiles. And as you would expect, there were times where it was very dark, and there were tears. And this is one of those times. It was, it was five days after the accident, and it was a Sunday, and the room was dark, and there were tears. And I was curled up in the corner, imagining my son in a dark place. I mean, so I was all set to go down a dark path. When Chris busted in on fire, and you know, Chris Boulder, she's a good friend of ours, and I, I joke that she's from the 60s. She's like a flower child. She's younger than me, but she's from the 60s. <laughs> and she burst in, and she's like, look, I can only tell this once. And it really kind of set us on our heels, because we're like, no, not more bad news. But she, she came in, and she told us what I just told you, and you know the, the energy in the room. I mean, at that point, I began to think of how we relate to one another. And as I continued down this journey, I began to think of ourselves as energy, how we relate to one another as energy. So the room was dark and heavy. She came in and shared that Quentin made contact, and the energy in the room changed. Everybody's energy went up. Everybody started smiling. There were gasps. That was that that gift of knowledge for me. Five days after, set the stage for this most amazing journey. In that moment, five days after my son died, five days after seeing dirt in his mouth and blood on his forehead and his ankle mangled, five days, my thought was, oh my. My son is still alive. My son is still alive, and he loves us so much that he's made contact with us. I didn't know it worked that way. I didn't speak that language. I didn't talk like this. I think if I were around anybody that did, I would probably kind of blend into the background and slide out the back door. <laughs> but here I was, five days after, and something Something profound happened. I knew my son wasn't dead. How does that happen? How does that happen? My son, I saw him die. And now he's demonstrating to me that there is no death. Five days after. 
it changed everything. Now I have to tell you, I mean, it's okay to be skeptical. We're human beings. We can be skeptical all we want. And I was too. Even after that, as powerful as I was, a week later, you know, it was, I believe it was after the, the, the services. I uh, was up at three or four in the morning, which is no surprise. And I started wondering why the medicine man was there, why the medicine man was there. Because I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Where did he come from? What was he doing? I think it's on page 102 of Quentin's messages. I, I share, um, I started Googling medicine man. It was a little broad. And uh, I learned, and it's just uh, so profound to me, I learned that there was a medicine man on staff at a hospital, I think it was South Dakota, and I thought that was really cool. But then I narrowed the search to something that really kind of seemed not nonsensical, it was medicine man four corners. And there it was. There was an article, and I, I reprinted it and copied it in a book, page 102. Um, in the, in the Cortez newspaper, or maybe the Farmington newspaper, it talked about the church, a Native American um, council uh, that was having a 60th anniversary meeting where 250 medicine men from all across North, uh, North America and South America were present for this, this ceremony. And I said, okay, <laughs> okay, I believe. Now I know. Now I know why the medicine man was there. Now I know how my son found him. But we were just getting going. <laughs> we, were, we were just getting started. Um, hummingbirds. Hummingbirds started visiting immediately and doing things that are unusual. And it, again, it's okay to be skeptical. And it's like, okay, Ernie and I see hummingbirds all the time. But their behavior was odd. It was strange. I had a friend of mine who, who wrote a poem, dear as like a brother, he wrote a poem, and in the poem, this is within days, this is before the service, we actually used it as the prayer card, he talked about hummingbirds. Well, we had a tree dedication, um, and this is immediately after the service, or a couple days after the service, and there were probably 30, 30 of us there, and a hummingbird, while the, the speaker is speaking, it wasn't me, I, I was out of it, there was a hummingbird hovering right over the tree that was being dedicated for our, our son. And everybody saw it, and everybody understood the significance. That summer, hummingbirds were flying in front of Christine, my, my wife Christine is sitting right over here, for those of you who don't know her, they come right to her face. And, and the reaction to that was, that's never happened before. Well, that's strange. Well, that's unusual. Some of us will move on from that and brush it off and think, okay, what a coincidence. As you go down this journey, you begin to examine those moments a little bit more. Um, it's not a coincidence, and it's not an accident. Um, it is a clear sign. You know, and I've talked, to, I've talked to dozens of people about the signs they've received, and they all share something, and they always say, well, they preface by this by saying, this was weird, this was strange, this was unusual. In, in the context of maybe a long conversation, then they ask me, Ernie, what do you think? And I always say, you know, you said that was weird and that was unusual and that's never happened before. I think you should re-examine that. I know what that is because of how our son came through. It's a sign. That's a gift to you, your child. Sibling, your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma is making contact. It's a powerful thing. But like I said, we were just getting going. We were just getting going. My hand was being held 30 hours after. It took me some time to realize it was Quentin. Somebody asked me, How do you know? Well, Quentin has the softest hands. We always held Quentin's hands. It makes perfect sense that he came to me in an empty room and held my hand. So there's no doubt. He comes to a medicine man and lets us know that he's fine. So there's no doubt. That summer, again, we're just getting going. That summer, I'm wearing my son's earring. 
and I'm not an ignorant guy, but I learned my son's errand, and I was in his bathroom, uh, the steam was dissipating, opened the door, across the hallway was his bedroom. And as I'm checking my earring and cleaning it out, I notice somebody walk across the room in Quentin's room. And I walk across the hallway, and I know who it was. It was Quentin. He was a little bit taller than he was before, but I walked across the hall, and I was thinking, okay, who's in the room? Is it my daughter, Cheyenne? Is it Christine? I mean, nobody was there. Nobody was there. You know, my wife says, what are you doing? I said, just saw Quentin. This doesn't happen to everybody, but for some reason, I think I'll probably cover that yeah, exactly, but for some reason, I was open to it, and I saw it, and I recognized it for what it was. But I was awake. I wasn't dreaming, and I'll talk about that as well. Within a week or two of that, I'm usually the first one out. I wasn't, wasn't three or four o'clock in the morning at this one particular time when I was walking down the hall, maybe six. And I hear our son, Quentin, call my name. And he says, Dad, I'm awake. And I'm shocked, I'm overjoyed. I'm, I'm just filled with awe and appreciation. And I, um, if you get to know me, you know I, I, I love to joke and of all things on this topic I know. Self-depreciating humor is a favorite of mine, but I joke, hey, I'm kind of slow, <laughs> kind of dense. It takes me a while, and even then it might take me a while. I couldn't think to talk to him. I just was like, ah, it's my son. My son just said hi to me. He said, Dad. A couple months after that, I had my second dream vision visitation, and I learned to differentiate between dreams. I think we all can agree that dreams are kind of blurry, easy to forget when you wake up and they're gone. But there's, there's a separate, there's a different dream. And hear me well, there's a different dream. There's a dream that's it's crystal clear. It's crystal clear. It's like it's real life. And we call those visits. And I woke up at five. I think I was going to go to the gym. You know, I wasn't feeling that. Closed my eyes. Went back to sleep. And immediately I saw Quentin. And we were outside the house. Mind you, I'm asleep now. An odd time. It's, you know, pretty much time to be up. I'm back to sleep by myself, transported outside our house. I'm on the ground level on the first floor, a two-story house, there's a deck above me. The sun had to have been in the western sky because at my feet there were the shadows from the rails on the deck and the shadow of a hooded figure. And I knew immediately. I knew immediately who it was. I knew that was quite. I thought I was not going to see him. I knew I was going to turn around, and I figured when I turned around to see him, he would just be gone. This was different. I turned around to see him, and I saw his face for the first time since the accident. Now it would have been about four months. This was October. We lost some on June 10. I saw his face. I saw the expressions on his face crystal clear like it was live and still imprinted on me. He was, he was surprised I could see him. Probably because he knows his dad's a little slow. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just, it's just being real, just being real. And he was anxious. And he, he knew what was gonna happen, because I was shocked. And I blurted out his name three times. Still asleep. Quentin. And I started to pick up. Quentin, a little bit closer. The last Quentin, I'm awake, and he saw this. He had ripped off his robe on the first Quentin, and the second Quentin, he's jumping off the deck, and the third Quentin, I wake up and my hands are outstretched, and I catch him, and I feel him. Now, some of you, I know Elizabeth knows this feeling, and probably others of you do too, but there's a feeling when your, your, your loved one melds with you, comes into you, 
touches you. It's this profound sense of peace. It's, I mean, it's unbelievably profound. It's the most peaceful, loving feeling. And I woke up and I felt that. And I knew he was with me. Now, eight years later, I, I recognize that feeling for what it is. When I feel that feeling, I know he's there. Um, I, I just had an you know, unusual dream only a month ago. And I felt him. I felt him there. And I woke up, and my flip-flops were perched on a stack of three pillows, one of them which I had thrown off the bed while I was sleeping. And they were sitting there, and I thought, all right, I'm going to All right, so. I can talk about signs. I can talk about signs all day. I can get excited about them. Some people might not want to hear them. They might think it's woo-woo. They might think, why are you talking about signs when your son is dead? Signs don't happen. Signs are impossible. We can't get signs from our deceased loved ones, from our transitioned loved ones, if they're dead. It doesn't work that way. If we're getting a sign, it's because they're alive. Now, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? This is a big leap for me, and it's a big leap for others. I mean, I wish, I mean, it's the ultimate demonstration that we are eternal beings. Do you think the world might be a better place if we all realize we're eternal beings? I do. And here we are, grieving the loss of our loved ones, our child, children, sibling, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. And here we are, and in this group, Helping Parents Heal, where we share these signs, we get to understand a larger version of reality. In a world today where they need to have this knowledge. Profound, profound. And I tell you, come to our meetings, um, talk to any of us individually, and if you, if you have a sign, if you've gotten a sign from your loved one, and you don't know, you want to talk about it, that's why we're here. It's a safe place. It's a safe place to share whatever's on your mind. Whether it's dark, whether you're angry, sad, or share, what do you think about this? I had this very strange thing happen the other day. Share that with us as well. So it pierced my consciousness that my son's not dead. And I began to read because I wanted to understand. And I discovered that this knowledge is everywhere. There have been so many books written about this in the past hundred years. So many books. And I think actually. Plato talked about something called merigazing. We talked about to see the spirit of your transition loved ones, you can you can sit in front of a mirror and and kind of don't don't look directly, but kind of soften your gaze. I think he might have mentioned using a candle as well. Um, Moody, what's Moody's first name? Hey. Raymond Moody talked about that as well in this book called Reunions as a way for us to make contact or see our transition loved ones. Interestingly enough, Christine realized or found out she was doing something very similar. When she puts her makeup on, she's got you know the, the mirror in the bathroom and then there's a side mirror and then she has her compact mirror and she might have one or two more mirrors. She's got mirrors all over the place. But early on, she began to realize that she could sense Quentin and she could see him out of her periphery. Now, when, you, when you're doing, quote unquote, mirror gazing, you know, you're supposed to look kind of indirectly at the mirror because you're going to see your loved one in the mirror. But as soon as you look, they're gone. <laughs> Christine, I mean, Quentin comes to, Quentin came to Christine all the time, all the time. There's so many books. There's, there's, 
one of the first books I read was um, Dr. Weiss, uh, Brian Weiss, Many Lives, Many Masters. And I read all of his books. And I read uh, Michael Newton. And I read his, I read his books, James on Prague, Sophie Brown, so many books. And then I read the New Testament. And for me, it just it fits two hands. Talking about there is more. It's, 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 well, let's just say you couldn't shut me up. <laughs> for three or four, maybe five years, you couldn't shut me up. I was, Christine tells me now I would scare people. I'm intentionally trying to be subdued now. Because I, this is magic. This is our world. This is reality. And I was on fire with it. I was on fire. This knowledge is everywhere. And here we are, together, in this awful place, this divine and awful dichotomy, where it's like, my child's not here. That sucks. I can't go out and see him get married. I can't go play catch with him. I can't this, I can't that. But, but, He's giving me signs. I know he's not dead. I was so on fire, and I, I mean, in large part, I still am. I'm not trying to be scary anymore. But this, I mean, can you feel that? Can you, can you, does it sink in? Do you feel it? I want, I want all of you to have this. I mean, I, I wish I could give this to everybody in the world. Because the world's gotten dark. And we've, we're not really, this is knowledge that needs to be shared. This is knowledge that needs to be shared. Now there was the signs over the top, amazing. But there was a moment. There was a moment that came before the first visit, the first sign. This is a moment that came before when it held my hand. And this came a full year, I think actually two years, before I read the New Testament. And I, I, I don't want to be preachy. I mean, because some people don't, don't, don't appreciate that. But there was a moment at the accident scene when I looked into the young lady's eyes who killed her son. She fell asleep on a curve, no drugs, no alcohol came into our area from 30 feet off the road, the airport, and she hit me first. Christine saved my life by screaming. She came into the area so fast she was airborne. She was flying at Sunbird, comes to my knee, she hit me on my hip. My back was to her. Christine screamed, but I was able to turn. She lost me. When I landed, my wife's body was torn and twisted. She had driven over the top of her seat. She had tire trucks, tire trucks across her body, had five broken ribs, and blow to the head, and flesh torn off her back, uh, broken fibula. And here we are. There she is. She didn't hit our son. She didn't hit Quentin. But when she sideswiped our vehicle, he was outside. He was caught between the trailer, hitched the trailer, and the back of the suburban legs must have been up against the trailer. So when she hit the Suburban, he got violently whiplashed his head hit the back of the Suburban. I know this to be a fact because I could see days later when I saw the vehicle where his head hit. And he landed back on the lip of the trailer and got a gash. Amanda walked up and saw this. She saw Christine's torn and twisted body. And my daughter, Cheyenne, told her it's going to be all right. I don't think Cheyenne understood the gravity of what was going on. But that's what she said. And Amanda walked over to us, to Quentin and I, and not a word was spoken. She was looking down at us. I've got blood dripping down my face. And I'm looking up at her. And from a certain perspective, I saw myself. And I don't know if that's, if that's understandable, but the horror, the horror I saw in her eyes, the shock and horror, the disbelief that I felt 
emanating from her so touched me that all I wanted to do was take it away from her. It so touched me. Now, we are all a compilation of our own experiences. So I'm telling you my experiences based on my history of what I've seen in my life. This moment of forgiving Amanda, it was born from my youth when I couldn't really handle a process in my home life. You know, I got a driver's license. I started driving a 68 Camaro really, really fast, doing really, really stupid things. And I would ask, it's a day of my day. And I would state, please don't let me take anybody with me. I knew on the way that came from. I knew I didn't want to take anybody with me. Maybe it came from a prior life. But that, that was my mantra. And when I looked at Amanda, when I saw the expressions on her face, and I felt her energy, I saw myself from that perspective. And I immediately forgave her. It wasn't a question. It wasn't Bible-based. Not that that's a problem. It wasn't an act. It wasn't a work. It came from here. And I believe that opened the door. And I, that opened the door. That changed my energy. I mean, I'm like any other guy. I'm like any other person, you know, in the world today. I mean, I, I can be angry. I can be vengeful. I can go to really dark places. I can, I can, you know, I can do that. I almost went there five days after. I mean, I was there. I mean, I was ready. I was standing on the edge. Imagining my son in a dark place when Chris Walters came in. But when Amanda walked up to me and I immediately forgave her, it changed something in me. And it opened a door. And I believe that made it easier for, for Quentin to, to make contact. I really, really do. And grieving, grieving is a tough thing. You know, and, and, and I talk about forgiveness. And I, I've talked about forgiveness in a room similar to this. And I've had people throw daggers at me because <laughs> they think I'm preaching and they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. You know, Jesus talks about forgiveness and, and I hope you're okay with me mentioning Jesus when he talks about forgiveness. How we're supposed to forgive somebody else. But no. I believe we've got to make sure we forgive ourselves too. I haven't found that in the Bible, but I firmly believe, I mean, because we can be our own worst enemy. You know, I've seen some posts from members of our group, and, you know, that's, it's, it's one thing to lose a child, but if you can find some way to blame yourself, whether it's the truth or not, and you hold on to that, that doesn't help. That does not help. That puts you in a dark place. So if, you know, forgiving others, great. Because that changes your energy. But if you're holding on to something, forgive yourself. Let it go. Let it go. But Ernie, you don't understand. I think I did. I feel I'm responsible for it. Hold on. Where did we start today? What have we been talking about today? We talked about signs. We talked about we are eternal beings. Let's not lose sight of that. And we do. As a nation, as individuals, we lose sight of that. And it's a tragedy. And I'll tell you, that's pretty much the only reason I'm still talking. It's a tragedy. We, we get to be on the, I mean, it's an awful place to be, but we get to be on the cutting edge if we decide to share within our group what we've experienced in these terms of how we've learned that we are eternal beings. If you're holding on to something, don't forget that you're an eternal being. If you're holding on to something, let's not forget that there is no death. This is real. This is real. That's what the signs mean. I've talked to dozens, and I've read hundreds of accounts, maybe thousands of accounts. This is our world. And 
we are still here. Our children, we can't walk them down the aisle, we can't play catch with them, we can't talk to them. They're not here in the physical, but they are in the non-physical. Same thing applies to us. How could it not? Right? How could it not? It's been eight years for Christine and I. And this is where we are now. And I hope I'm not moving too fast. I mean, first we have to grieve. First we have to process that. Cry. Be angry. Scream. Beat on a heavy bag. Go for a run. I liken that to purging the dark emotions. We've got to do something with them. When I talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, I, I tell them, you let it out. You burn it off. You, you, you do whatever you have to do to the point of being exhausted. Cry until you're exhausted. Run until you're exhausted. Beat on the heavy bag until you're exhausted. Scream at the top of your lungs until you are exhausted. And when you're exhausted, close your eyes. And think about your child. The good memories. The laughter. The smiles. Burn off the dark stuff. Lifts your energy a little bit because you burned off the dark stuff. Makes it easier for our kids to make contact. And whatever it takes, whatever it takes to make contact, we are still here. We are still here. We live to honor our children. We are here to help. We are here to enjoy. We are here to learn. We are still here. You know, Quentin, and I send, I send both my books, I send Quentin's messages and Quentin's legacy. Quentin is an old soul. Um, how many can relate to or vibe on that comment, old soul? How does that happen? It cracks me up. I love dogma. <laughs> I guess I'm being a little sarcastic. I love it. I mean, nobody wants to talk about reincarnation, but they'll openly talk about old souls and old eyes. And we are eternal. And our son is an old soul. Has anybody heard about soul contracts? It makes sense if you can get your arms around coming back time and time again with a purpose. If you if I've lost you, read Brian Weiss, many lives, many masters. Messages from the Masters. Also read Michael Newton, Journey of Souls, Destiny of Souls. Read those four books. And if I've lost you, now you'll understand. After you've read them, you'll understand what I'm referring to. But I was told that, that Quentin and I had done this before. And I didn't get it. Why? Well, you know why I'm a little slow. <laughs> I didn't get it. We had to do it again. Tell you what, I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> We're not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again. We're still here to learn. We're still here to grow. We're still here to help one another. And that's a gift. Yeah, we want to be with him. Of course I want to be with him. Of course I want to see him. But no, I'm here to help. I'm here to speak to you. I'm here to deal with my own demons, to learn maybe someday to enjoy life. <laughs> I'm still here. You all are here for your own reasons. I'll talk a little bit about grieving. Um, I think we all heard some the, uh, the stats about married couples and how hard it is for them to get through this. And I, I get that. Uh, we had some dear friends of ours who were, were made sure to point it out. <laughs> and it drove my wife crazy. Um, we grieve differently. And that's okay. We, 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 we can't expect to grieve alike. That's not fair. Christine and I, you know, we, we grieve differently and almost, I mean, really kind of changed positions. We switched roles. I was the cranky, tired, unforgiving, angry, <laughs> frustrated, 
guy, and Christine's this loving old soul who's put up with me for now 25 years. But in the months, in the months immediately after Quentin's transition, I, as I've shared, had my eyes open wide, and I was beginning to process this, wait a second, there's more going on here. There's more to us. And I was starting to glow. And Christine, she, you know, she, she grieved the way I wish I had. She was angry, and she cried a lot, and she wanted to be left alone. Me, I flat out said, don't leave me alone, because the darkness was around the corner. And I don't want to make the darkness my friend. So I, I'm like, stay with me, and let me fill the silence with words. Let me talk to you about what happened. She got upset with me. That sweet woman over there got upset with me. And she cursed me, and she told me, you don't even care. You don't even care. Now the old me would have probably got upset, but I had enough sense to step away. I say that to say this, it's okay, we grew differently. We have to be patient with one another. We have to, we have to. We know people everywhere who are grieving, who just lost somebody, and we're human beings. You know what, I still think we're good human beings. By and large, there's good human beings on this planet. And we wanna help. We want to say something, some magic words, take their pain away. Sometimes those magic words have quite the opposite of that. You know, there's no words to help somebody who's in, in a dark place and who's grieving the loss of a loved one, you know, in the early stages, maybe ever. There's no magic words. I don't care, even if you mean well, even if you're projecting a loving energy, those magic words may have quite the opposite of that. You know what, I, I've learned. And I'm the kind of guy who wasn't there. I wasn't. I'm the kind of guy, if Jeff was in the room, I slipped out the back. I was that kind of guy. I'm, I'm not happy about it. I'm not proud about it. I'm just telling you. But now I know. I don't want to say a word. All I do is sit with you. All I do is hold your hand. All I have to do is be with you. Is put an arm around you. I don't want to say a word. Just come with you. We comfort, we comfort each other. We're not meant to do this alone. Okay. Don't try to fix it with words. Let me talk. For those who showed up around me, they got an earful. <laughs> they began to say, hey man, you gotta ride a boat. <laughs> but recognize we breathe differently and don't judge when there's a judgment made. Don't judge, don't judge others, don't judge yourself. Profound. Profound. There's, there's something here. I, uh, when I finally read the New Testament, I actually typed up Christina Lab because I type things and make outlines, but I actually type one of the scriptures I love. It's Luke 6.37. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will come or it will all come back against you. Forgive others, and you will be forgiven. I love this. I love this verse. He's talking about judgment and forgiveness in the same verse. You know, and if, if any of you are mad at God, if any of you are upset with the tragedies man has done in the name of God, try to put it aside for a second and just let that verse sink in. That's the judgment of ourselves and others is detrimental. The, the, the not being able to forgive others and ourselves it puts us in an awful place. It puts us in an awful place. And that applies to grieving as well. You know, and, and it's, it's okay. We'll, we'll be grieving the rest of our lives. There's no going back to normal. No. I'm eight years in. Who would want to go back to what normal is? Thinking money is more important. Thinking corporate ladders are more important. Divine knowledge. This is divine knowledge. We came about it in an awful way. But here we are. Here we are. And we're here to help. And we're here to serve. 
I don't have anything else to talk about. <laughs> Joel helps me with what I do because I, you know, um, he died by suicide and he wants to help other warriors who come back. And so I started an organization called The Ripple Effect, Helping Veterans Families Heal. And every step of the way, he helps me. And so I get up at these suicide prevention workshops I do and I speak from a gold mother's point of view. And I call him an angel on my shoulder. And that's how people can accept him. I'd like to be able to say more, but I just don't really think that my intuition tells me that that's what I need to, to do. So, you know, I'd like to honor him more. And I do with people that I know yeah. who accept that. But. I am, um, I think because I'm a man, and I'm, I'm not a little man. <laughs> Nobody has really come at me. Um, when I've allowed myself to be approachable with, let's say, good acquaintances, I've had some make some interesting comments to me, like, you know, Ernie, we just did not take you. We just kind of thought you were trying to keep your son alive. They don't get it, because he is. No, he's not here, but he is. He is. You know, and, and we're going to meet people who don't get it. You know, I've heard some horror stories about our brothers and sisters who are grieving, and they've tried to share a sign or tried to be honest with their feeling and had a, love, a, a, a family member or a loved one shut them down with force. I'm so sorry, but um, maybe, I'm not to be judgmental, but maybe you don't need to hang out with that person. If somebody's not there for your greatest good, then why hang out with them? You know, I tell that to my nephews. I mean, that statement alone has other context. If you got somebody around you who's tearing you down and not building you up and not helping you process and grieve, and telling you don't, don't do that, people think you're crazy, don't hang out with them. How's that for a don't? <laughs> right? You know, um, follow your intuition. I mean, if your intuition is to be reserved and not hit in between the eyes with a big old aha, then don't. But, you know, again, follow your intuition. Maybe there are people that you feel like you can't approach. I have had that experience where I thought, this might be interesting. This person might not really feel me and I was totally, completely blown away because they did, and they took it to another level that I wasn't there to yet. Don't be afraid. But, but if you've got people that are not supporting you in the grieving process and in your new reality, I mean, they tend to drift off anyway, but if they're there trying to pull you down, you know, to me, the decision is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Do you meditate, and how is it that you connect with with Quentin best? Is it through dreams or through meditation? Oh boy, um, I do meditate. Um, my my meditation practice isn't what it should be, but sometimes I sit in a room and I meditate. Sometimes I go on a walking meditation. So I was doing up in Colorado last week, and this deer started following me. Um, Hummingbirds still, I mean, they still come to my face. And, you know, and, and uh, we've had so many signs that maybe the awe has worn off a little bit. The, the, the feeling of amazement has worn off a little bit. But the knowledge is still there. You know, so to answer your question, Elizabeth, I, we can have a point in the silence. It's in the silence. You know, when he, when he, um, you know, it's, it's, it's this, this dream I had the other night, a month ago. Um, I had been in the gym that day, and I saw somebody that I was concerned about. So as I'm dreaming, I just put this energy, a white energy bubble around this person to protect them. And in that place of trying to help another, I felt quick. 
that's Dick Stoggins, because that's, that's who Quentin is. That's, that's who he was in the flesh, and that's who he continues to be, always trying to help. So it's in the silence, whether it's, it's red-tailed hawks or hummingbirds or deer. And there was one sign, I, I always forget this one. See, I'm not looking at my notes, I had it written down, but uh, when we got back from the accident, there had been a deer bedding down outside of our master bedroom window. And we could see, and it was still there. And wait for it, you know what I'm gonna say, it had never happened before. It had never happened before. No, it had since. I was wondering, when you talked about Raymond Moody, he, the first book that I read when Morgan passed was Life After Life. And I don't know if people are familiar with that book, but it is um, kind of a, a good way to start to understand this journey. Um, and Raymond Moody actually went to UVA, and when he was a student, he was mirror gazing because he was studying Plato. He was studying the, um, the writings of Plato, and his parents had him institutionalized for years because of the fact that they thought he was crazy. And here he is. He's, he must be 85 now. He's written tons of books, and he's so knowledgeable about this. But yes, I think it's fascinating that you are able to mirror gaze. Well, I didn't know what it was. I, you know, I mentioned it to him, what was happening to me, and it just happened that we had been, gone to the meeting at the Logo Center, and they started teaching upon it in the, what do they call the? In the threshold room. Threshold room. And I, Ernie and I looked at each other and said, that's what I was experiencing here amongst the mirrors in my home. Yeah. So it was Wonderful. pretty awesome. I want to, I want to, I mean, we can sit here, I mean, me especially, can tell stories until the sun goes down. Um, I've read a lot. In my second book, I've got a list of what I've read, and it's probably not current anymore. But in Michael Newton's book, Destiny of Souls, he told, he shared something about Elizabeth Kubler Ross. I don't know if you've heard of her. Yeah. Um, she, she researched death and the five stages of grieving, and, and she was a powerhouse in and of herself, but her mother was also a powerhouse. Very fiercely independent, taking care of everybody, but never really, you know, had to accept anybody helping her. So as, as her mom got older, as Elizabeth's mom got older, she started having health issues. And Elizabeth started having to take care of her, but Elizabeth was mad. Elizabeth was pissed. And she was talking to God. I mean, I don't want to say she was talking to God. She was screaming at God. Why? Why does my mom have to go through this? It's not fair that she's now an invalid. It's not fair. And God answered. And God said, keep in mind, we are eternal. Keep in mind, we're here to learn and grow. But God said, this is a gift to your mom. What? My mom's an invalid. My mom is sick. My mom can't take care of herself. She's dependent. He says, this is a gift to your mom. She needs to learn how to accept the love and help from another. And she gets to do it now, in the last four years of her life, instead of having to come back and live a lifetime like that. It's perspective. Quentin opened me up to a broader view of reality. A broader, I mean, a whole another level of knowledge. And on one hand, you can say, why did he tell me this story? Why did Ernie just say this? On the other hand, you know what? That's profound. How can that exchange between Elizabeth Kubler Ross and God in regards to Elizabeth's mom, how does that relate to anything that I'm going through? Much of what I say is meant for the person hearing me. I mean, listening to me is one thing, but to hear me and feel me, for you to say, okay, how does this apply to me? Because again, I'm here to help you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
what we're going to do is just break for about 10 minutes and then we're going to put the chairs in a circle and hopefully you all can stay 